In this show, we're answering your High Cave answers because, uh, you know, I think we talked about everything that's coming at DubDub yesterday. Want the latest Apple news leaks and rumors? Subscribe and ring the bell. This video is sponsored by Aura. First question comes from James Apple. Are you doing any merch for DubDub 2022? Well, this is the one that we did last year. This is where everyone submitted their uh, Memojis. But last time I asked people to submit Memojis, nobody kind of bothered. So uh, I feel feel like we're going to leave this style. But if anyone's got any cool suggestions for what we should do, you know, let me know. Um, at the moment, I haven't got any particular plans. But uh, the Cupertino range, maybe we'll do something for Cupertino range again um, that kind of fits in with Dub Dub. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Next up, Ugaza asks, IK Vances, when do you think the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros will get the M2 treatment? Easy, we only just got those ones. Um, so these have been out for about nine months now. My thoughts still, and I've said this right from the beginning, is that Apple will eventually move on to an annual update cycle on everything in Apple Silicon. And I think it might be once we've got through M2 that we actually get to that point, fingers crossed, once most of the redesigns are out of the way at least. So that way, Apple can then move on to just dealing with chip upgrades and, you know, one redesign a year maybe two redesigns a year something along those lines and then we've got a little bit more uh, leeway for apple to get going in terms of the m2 uh, this would be the macbook pros with m2 pro and m2 max inside my thoughts is that this is going to be a little bit later i think this is probably going to be around spring next year most likely um, that makes sense because then that's about an 18 month uh, turnaround, which is at the moment, if we do get our M2 MacBook Air and Mac Mini, that'll be just over 18 months because it was November and then it's going to be a year and then June. So that, that kind of makes sense, right? Let's go with 18 months for now. So that would be my thoughts. What will it be is a more interesting question. I think uh, the M2 is going to be very much along the lines of an evolution of what we had with M1 Pro and M1 Max. Um, we are going to get those additional graphics cores, which is kind of the, uh, to an extent, the, the area that Apple was falling down a little bit more than they did on the CPUs. And I think the other thing that would be really interesting is what they do with what's inside the notch, because that notch is too big for just the camera module. Pretty confident that if uh, they were putting that notch there in the first place, it was because they were hoping to get Face ID in there. I think Face ID is still on their roadmap. I think they still would really like to have the Face ID in there, uh, as opposed to Touch ID as being the, the primary kind of biometric. I think it would work well for a laptop as you open it up it automatically knows to check face ID and uh, you get logged straight in and I still think the face ID would be really good for multiple user systems so it could identify different people especially if you put it on an iMac this is what I was saying right from the beginning when they were looking at redesigning the iMac is that if you put face ID on something like an iMac then when it's being used in schools for example the different pupils can literally sit in front of whatever Mac they want and it will log them into that system uh, pulling up all all of their user data and uh, all of their files from the server which makes the most sense in the world next up mark graf asks if we are getting the four core mac pro do you have any gossip on the physical geometry will the layout be two by two or four by one if two by two then it sounds like a completely different die to the current ones so this is um this is a difficult one because basically from what we know the m uh the m1 max which is what is paired up to make the m1 ultra has got an interconnect but only along one side it's not along both ends either it's along one side and it looks to me as if that's the way that they're kind of made in the factory when they're actually made on the dies i think they're actually connected in the first place i don't think they reconnect them um, i think that they're actually produced connected when there's errors on one or the other then they split them and if there's errors on that big chunk of gpu in the middle then they cut it down again and that's what becomes the m1 pro that would be my best guess with this However, Fred the Frenchy, um, Frederick Orange, I think on Twitter, um, has put up some slides which I'll throw on the screen right now. Uh, I'm going to have to work from memory because I don't have them in front of me because I'm, I'm just talking to a camera. But he had kind of three concepts. The first one would be uh, basically just having two of the dies completely separate. So you basically got two M1 Ultras individually in the M1 Mac Pro or Power Mac if they go with my naming, which I think they should definitely watch yesterday's video if you haven't already, uh, I explain why. But uh, you basically just have two of those running as separate chips, but uh, basically with one in charge of the system and the other one kind of taking tasks as needed. 
uh, the the middle version that he had. So that was that would be the easiest one to do, where they basically have to do the least R and D to make it different. The the middle version, like the the step two, would be to have four of these chips that are fully interconnected in the same way that an M1 Ultra is basically connected along one side. These would be connected along two sides. Uh, so that would be more R&D involved, but also faster interconnects. So it means that the chips would work better together uh, in the real world. And the third version was actually to take the four chips, connect them together like in version two, but also allow external PCI and RAM and like additional storage lanes um, so that it was a lot more expandable. Um, I think we're probably going to get the first version. I think we're going to get the lowest uh, difficulty version for this first version. And I think it is going to be two or maybe four M1 Ultras in one box. Before we move on to the next question, we're going to run through a few new Notification Squad members. We've got Joe Himes and we've got Team Walkies Podcast and Anthony McIntosh. Thank you for joining. All you need to do if you want to join too, hit the subscribe button and make sure you've rung the bell. And then let me know hashtag Notification Squad down in the comments section. Next question. I gave answers. Hi Dave, what kind of food do you enjoy? Are you more of a pastry guy or do you enjoy meat? Just like when people ask me tea or coffee, it's a very simple co uh, answer. The, the answer is always coffee. If you ask me what I enjoy eating, it's pizza. Pizza is basically the best food there is in the world. And John Malkin asks, IK Vances, will the iPad Pro always be a touchscreen MacBook Air with less thermal envelope? Seems like a Pro Lite. And this is a difficult one because I didn't expect that they would kind of call it an M1 in there. I think if they kept calling it an A14X or an A14Z or whatever, it would have actually made more sense and it wouldn't have felt like, well, why is this called Pro when that's the Air and then this is, but then there's also a MacBook Pro that's got the M1 inside it. Um, so I don't think the thermal envelope is a massive issue because of the kind of software that tends to be run on iPads. I don't really understand why we have iPad Pro. Uh, originally it was just iPad Big because I don't think it even had a different chip. I think they all had the X chips at the time and then the A chips got fast enough so it's a whole big mess. But all of that being said I think we have to realise that this is pro in the kind of landscape of what pro means to an iPad. Uh, it is the most professional version, it has got the power of a Mac in what is basically a touchscreen device. I, I don't think that they're ever going to go to the point where keyboard and trackpad is first for the iPad because then what's the point? It might as well be a MacBook. But I do think that some of these pro apps are going to come across and once we add things like Final Cut Pro and Xcode and uh, Logic to the iPads that you're able to run on these thin, light, touchscreenable, like one-handable devices that you, you can actually interact with an iPad much, much easier when you're kind of wandering around than you could with a laptop. Um, so I think that's, that's where the difference comes. Um, but you will be able to do pro stuff on them. You can do pro stuff on them already because a lot of people buy a MacBook Pro and then write on it, uh, which doesn't seem like it's that demanding. This video is sponsored by Aura. Do you know what the fastest growing crime in America is? For years, the crime rate has been surging and affecting millions of Americans. I'm talking about identity theft, and there's a new victim every 14 seconds. Yet despite this, those who have their identity stolen are often shocked when it happens. Imagine trying to log into your email account only to see that your password has changed hours ago. Then you start getting notifications of activity from your bank, credit cards, crypto accounts. That's when the feelings of panic, fear, anxiety, paranoia, disbelief, shock, anger, and frustration and guilt set in. That's why I'm excited to partner with Aura, who is sponsoring this video. Aura is an identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, and a VPN, password management software, and antivirus software combined into one easy to use app. Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers, and sends you alerts fast right to your phone and email. When it comes to fraud, every second matters. Connect your credit cards and bank to be notified of any changes up to four times faster than Aura's competitors. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal personal information safe and encrypted, and their antivirus software that will block malware and viruses before they infect your devices. Sadly for me, Aura is currently only available in the US, but if you check out their free trial, be sure to let me know in the comments how many times your information has been detected on the dark web. Protect you and your family from America's fastest growing crime. Try Aura free for two weeks and see if any of your family's personal information has already been compromised. Start your free trial at aura.com forward slash iCaveDave. Thank you to 
to Aura for sponsoring the show. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we will have another show tomorrow, fingers crossed, although work is a bit crazy this week, so bear with me. But uh, if you've got any more questions, leave them down in the comments section. Thanks to the Patreons, and we'll see you in the next one.